Case File 003-111 Case File Date April 12, 1984 Location Constance, Pennsylvania Subject Mary Cowell, Alex Kepler Entity Unknown Entity Codenamed Ebis The following is a record of the interrogation of Alex Kepler. Alex Kepler, age 24, lived with Mary Cohen. Lives. I live with her, not past tense. But she's gone. I'm going to find her. We'll see, Mr. Kepler. Could you please start at the beginning of when Miss Cohen and yourself started having encounters with the entity? The bastard who took her? Stands up, infuriated. Two operatives walk towards him and he sits back down, sighing to regain composure. Yeah, the beginning. Thing is, it didn't start with us. Not initially. People started turning up missing... <laughs> turning up missing is a funny way to word things. It's like saying you appeared to not appear or some shit. You're getting off topic, Mr. Kepler. People were starting to vanish. Kids, adults, old people. And one day a person was simply gone. It kinda missed the news, I guess. We aren't a huge city or anything, though so 20, 30 people missing wasn't being covered. I'm ashamed to say that most people in the town took a didn't happen to me, so I'm going to look the other way stance. As long as someone's kid or lover didn't go missing, they just sorta of carried on as normal. And I was right fucking there with them. I just wanted to work my shitty job, be with my awesome girlfriend and maybe get around to doing something with my life. Alex slumps down for several minutes in his chair. He doesn't move or say anything. Mr. Kepler? Alex, we need you to continue your story. <sighs> yeah, there were five of us, right? My friend group. It was Darren, Lissa, Oliver, Mary and me. We were all old high school friends and had yet to move out of town. Just five people working, hanging out, living. It really was pretty much like being in high school. We'd all work all day and then meet up at one of our places and spend the rest of the day hanging out. It was nice. Maybe naive in a way, but nice. It was on one of these nights that the shitstorm began. <sighs> Five of us were over at Darren's place. We were drinking and watching scary movies. Darren had just broken up with his she-bitch and celebrations were held. Anyway. I remember looking over and seeing Lisa just staring at his photo. Looked like one of those ones that pop out of the bottom of the camera immediately after you take the picture. I don't really remember what those are called. Pretty sure it's called a Polaroid camera. Could be wrong. Secrets. Well, she was just staring at his picture intensely. I was sort of amused by the whole thing, so I made some funny faces in her direction. She didn't look up from the picture and a minute or so had gone by so I finally chatted her up. Hey Liz, what you got there? I remember her jumping a little when I spoke. She was a tiny mousy girl that was always so serious that it was actually almost humorous to me to see her jump like that. Hey ha, nothing really, I don't think. Hey Darren? Darren turned away from the slaughter fest on the screen and turned back to her. Yeah? I didn't know you had one of those weird cameras. I don't own a camera, Lissa. You know I hate having my picture taken. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, could you come look at this? Darren got up, took a look at the picture, and I saw his mouth drop slightly, and he looked more than a little disturbed. Yo, man, what is it? He looked up at me and kind of shrugged it off, I guess. That bit of horror or whatever I had seen was replaced by his usual non-believer smart guy attitude. The photo was a picture of Darren which was weird in itself. Darren hated being in them. Whenever we took a group picture, Darren was always the cameraman. Anyway, the picture was of Darren standing outside at the park in town. He wasn't too far away from the camera just enough that you could see him from head to toe. Overall, he was a pretty average kid. 
Average height, average build. Glasses, some disheveled hair and his trademark questioning the laws of the universe at all times makes me seem like a better intellectual face was plastered on. This was all fairly normal besides the fact that Darren should never be in a picture. In the background was a tree. It was pretty big, probably an oak or maple tree. It was maybe 20 yards behind Darren and there was a figure leaning out from behind the tree. It was Elsa Darren. Sorta. Of. It certainly looked like Darren, for the most part, but there, there were some minor differences. No glasses, the shirt had some kind of dark stain on it, uh, his hair was matted down in parts, but, 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 but what really stood out was the face and hands. His hands were around each side of the tree as he leaned out from behind it and were clearly claws. They, they weren't just some photo illusion, they were some serious looking claws. His mouth was open and his mischievous looking smile, like the biggest prank ever was about to happen to normal Darren. The eyes were the eyes were the worst part. Or a lack of them I should say. They were definitely just two black circles. The distance was far away, though so that at the time I remember thinking that it could have just been Mark or a really good pen. Everyone got a good look at the picture and we all sat there for a few seconds. Well, one of us is good at pranks. I remember chiming in to break the silence. We all played it off after that as a prank. Stupid. That was so, so stupid. I couldn't think of a single way that you could edit one of those photos to add weird Darren in the background. <laughs> On top of that, You'd have to initially get the first two pictures of Darren in the first place and, and that was nigh impossible. Life went on for about another week. I thought things were normal and everything was fine, but <sighs> looking back on it I can see the signs. Fucking hindsight. The group would meet up except for Darren. We'd give him a call, he said he was sick. That happened three times and he skipped out on a dinner without telling anyone. We all just assumed that he must seriously be ill. So after dinner I went over to his place to check on him, while the others went back to Mary and Maya's house. The house was pitch black, except for a light coming from his bedroom on the second floor. The door was unlocked, so I let myself in. Unsurprisingly, uh, unsurprisingly I found him in his room sitting at his desk. Laid out on the desk were several photos like the one from earlier in the week. I just remember him looking so haunted. He had huge dark circles around his eyes and he definitely hadn't been showering, probably not eating as well. Hey man, what's up? I remember asking him so feebly. I was afraid of my own friend. Hey. Just one word. He sounded so defeated. Hello. It wasn't like him at all. Wh what are these? More photos? I started leaving through them. Yeah, they keep popping up around me every few hours. The weird Darren crept closer to Darren in each frame. It was hunched over in an almost comical sneaking pose. At the end of the series of photos, it stepped into the exact pose that Darren had been in so that the picture was just a picture of weird Darren from head to toe. Now that he was this close to the camera, I could see how off it was. I could see how off it was. The stains and the clothes were blood. The matted down hair was also from blood, I think, and the skull looked like it had been cracked open in the back. The hands were definitely clawed, also not in quite as an extreme manner as I had thought before. Darren's mouth was twisted up into a grin or mockery of one. And now I, I could see that the teeth were pointed and fang-like, and there were no doubts now that his eyes were just blacked out holes. The whole thing almost gave you a sense that it was gloating over the fact that it had taken Darren's place. I flipped the photo over to see that "and" had been written on the back of it. You write us, Darren? No, it was already there. I noticed him slump a bit. Darren, Darren was crying, the most logical of my friends, and more often devoid of emotion than not, 
Darren was sobbing away. There were no words. I didn't say anything. I, I just hugged him, I guess. Maybe embraced is a better word. He was my friend and he needed me, so I was there. I remember asking him if he wanted to come to my place and him refusing bluntly. So I helped him get in bed and I told him I would stay there till he fell asleep and then I would head back to my place. He went, eventually did fall asleep and I went home. Not a mistake. I've made a lot of those recently. I didn't talk to the others about what had happened. I told them he definitely wasn't feeling good and that I was going to go over to his place the next day and stay with him. That didn't happen. I messed up so bad. Hell, it's, it's even a f fucking horror cliche, but part of me, part of me wouldn't believe it, of course. When I got to the house, he was gone, and of fucking course the room was stressed. The serious signs of a scruffer and any direction. The room was stressed. Serious signs of a scruffer in any direction. I, I looked. I lost Darren because I refused to believe in the shit going around me. At this point, Mr. Kepler breaks down. All attempts to communicate with him fail, and he is taken back to his room. The interrogation continues on the next day. Are you ready to continue, Alex? Surely you want to help us catch this thing. We filed a report with the police because my friends thought it would help. I still wasn't talking about the photos. But I wasn't in denial at this point. My goal was to protect my friends that were left and to catch this thing. I read up on town history, local legends and even into the other people missing. Nothing. Two weeks spent being vigilant and intense research and I couldn't come up with anything. Left with little options, I decided to tell my friends what I knew. Maybe they'd help. Maybe they wouldn't. So when we were all together, I dropped everything I knew on them. I mean, it wasn't much, but I could tell them about what happened with Darren and the photos. They took it better than I thought they would. Oliver was a little disbelieving, but that was just in his nature. Mary seemed to take what I said to heart though. I remember Lisa just sort of being there. She was always quiet and soft-spoken, but it seemed strange to me that she just has nothing to say. Now I was talking about hindsight earlier, but seriously. It seriously kills me that I didn't pick up on this at the time. Later that night, I was woken by a phone call. It was Lisa. She was, sob she was sobbing heavily and I could barely understand her. She asked that I come over immediately. I told Mary to stay at home because Lissa didn't really tell me what was wrong. I remember thinking that if it was whatever took Darren, I could get revenge. It wasn't to be though. Lissa was gone by the time I got to her house. I didn't know if she had been taken or fled so I looked around a bit and I found a pile of photos like the ones Darren had. In the first photo there was a picture of Lisa of Lisa. There was a picture of Lisa from about the waist up and she was staring straight ahead at the camera. I couldn't really make out anything in the background that could be threatening her. Then I looked at her face. She looked scared. I noticed her throat had a bulge in it like something big was lodged in it. In the series of photos she had the bulge worked its way up and up till she had her cheeks puffed out, sort of like a blowfish. Flipped over to the last photo in the pile, Lissa's mouth was now wide open, probably about as far as she could, probably as far as she could manage, and the largest, nastiest looking spider I've ever seen was forcing its way out. I flipped the photo over and once again saw, and written on the back. She had kept this all to herself and pretended it wasn't happening, as opposed to Darren, who shut himself off from others. This didn't set well with the others when I showed them. Oliver actually skipped town. He didn't want any more to do with this, and I, and I honestly think that might have been the right thing. He may be, he may be fine now. Not like Mary. Mary and I were sort of in a haze after that. I lost the will to fight for my two lost friends, and Mary just sort of shut off. 
we, we stayed this way for maybe a m month or so. I did get my will to fight back, however, after Mary found her first photograph. With her, the photo was process was even more intimate than the others because she was sharing with me how she felt. Her photo was initially a picture of her standing by her leg. The only off thing about it was a slight pale blue tinge to her skin and lips, almost not noticeable. Her progression was soon made apparent though. The skin turned even bluer, her eyes glazed over and her body began to bloat. This was Mary, if she had drowned and been left in the water. That's when I pieced another piece of this thing together. Mary's worst fear ever was drowning. It was so bad that she sometimes had to be coaxed into a swimming pool and she never swam in a lake or river. Lissa was definitely afraid of spiders. I'd seen her hair stand on and just at the sheer mention of them. I wasn't quite sure what Darren's picture represented, but I assume it had something to do with him hating getting his picture taken. Our worst fears were being portrayed in his photos. Whatever this was, it had an intimate knowledge of us that definitely unsettled me. Mary only got worse as we found more photos. This happened for maybe a week and a half. I had quit work and spent all the time talking to people who were family of or who know all the abducted people. Some of them mentioned weird photos and others had no idea what I was talking about. In the end, I knew a little more when we got the last photo with and written on the back. I was around her constantly at this point. I had a baseball bat and a will to protect the love of my life. Mary was the exact opposite. She was giving up and ready to just accept how pointless it all was. The photos, you know, something about them trains you, makes you want to accept whatever that unknown end is. But at that point I was feeling anything but giving in. I was angry. I was brave. I was foolish. The night it, he, whatever, came to take care I was awake. Watching out of our bedroom as she slept. I had been taking little burst naps during the day so that I could spend all night awake and protecting her. There's an eerie feeling when that thing enters your room. It's cold, but not regular cold. It's more like just a sheer absence of heat. I freaked up when this happened, grabbing my bed and pacing the room, looking for anything grotesque that I could kill. I pulled a full circle and was surprised at what I did find. A figure was standing over the bed, right beside my Mary. It was definitely male, wearing a black hoodie that obscured all of its face. I think, I think it was wearing baggy jeans or some shit too, but I really wasn't just standing there studying the damn thing. I rushed him and took a swing at his head. The intruder coughed a bad mid-swing, just stopping my entire attack. I noticed the claw hand from Darren's picture and was then forced into the wall. Hard. What I saw him do after that was beyond belief for a rational person. But I am far past rational at this point. His body seemed to unzip, not just the hoodie, but his entire body. He took his new wingspan, cloak span, I don't fucking know. But he took both sides of his unzipped body and enveloped Mary. Then the fucker glanced up at me. I still couldn't see his face, but I know I coughed a smile before they disappeared. <laughs> you guys pretty much know the rest. He found me at the police station after I told my story and raised a ruckus. I've been captured since. So tell me, that thing wasn't human, was it? It's a paranormal or otherworldly entity, actually. We believe it stalks and then abducts its victims to its home plane of existence. Since when do monsters wear a fucking hoodie? You'd be surprised at what we found them in. Suits, fancy wear, the more intelligent ones do it for reasons we haven't fully discovered. And you're keeping me here because? Quite frankly, we feel that you're the next target and we want to catch it when you're attacked. Mr. Kepler steps off for a while before reaching into his pocket and pulling out a photograph. He pushes it across the table to the interrogator. You've already received your first photo? More like my last. But I see nothing wrong with this. It's just a picture of you. Mr. Kepler slumps again a defeated posture. That photo used to have Mary and I in it. Each photo I got she was more and more transparent. 
until I was the only one there. My greatest fear was losing her, which ironically has already happened. So if it's all the same to you, let me go. I need to prepare for this thing so I can kill it. Or it can take me and I'll find her there. Either way, it won't do me any good to be trapped here. I'm sorry, Mr. Cather, but you will be staying here. We need to catch this entity, and you are now our best lead to do so. Alex Kepler was then led back to his cell. Various C-class detectors and P-servers were placed in and around the cell. Unfortunately, Subject 653 attempted another breakout and the non-paranormal Sector 12 lost power for several minutes. Alex Kepler escaped and was never found again. He is assumed to have been taken by the newly dubbed Ebus. Analysis This entity has officially been named Ebus by the research staff due to its connection to Ether and its manner of abduction. It somehow uses ether to warp between locations. It is also assumed that it can manipulate ether to create the various photographs that victims receive. Ebus is definitely highly intelligent. It toys with its victims and we can only assume it does this to amuse itself. Tests on e-particles left on the photos and at abduction scenes have led us to be able to track the ebus and other creatures that dwell in its plane of existence. Abducted victims seem to be taken to an ethereal plane which could harm or kill normal human beings. I strongly suggest we move ahead with the Flint Directive and proceed with the Hysteria Project. It also appears that Ebus has moved locations. We are not exactly sure why. It could be that it was hunting something specific in Constance or it might be because we discovered its hunting ground and didn't want us to so close to it. Regardless, we lack the means to fight Ebus as of now. Case file unresolved. The farther I read, the more I hate Organization 440. So I guess that's a given, right? I've started reading Case 54. It appears to be about the Hysteria project, so at least we'll find out what's going on with that. Might as well go farther down the rabbit hole. Secrets. <laughs>